so real, is so present. I suggest the absence of a quorum. Senator from Virginia. Mr. President, I rise to speak about the uh, NDAA, which is currently on the floor. I want to address a couple of issues, um, an issue that's, that I'm passionate about, the veterans' unemployment rate and how it's dealt with in the NDAA, shipbuilding issues, the critical issue of sexual assault and misconduct, and finally, sequester. Uh, but before I begin, let me just talk about how important this bill is. This is a bill that the Senate has passed every year for over 50 years. We pass it every year, even if we can't pass a budget, even if we can't do other things, because it's so critical that we show those who serve in the military that we're behind them. I've heard some indications, even the last 24 hours, that because of so many amendments might be possible on this bill, would that call into question whether we might be able to keep our streak going? If we have to be here Christmas Day, we need to be on the floor Christmas Day to make sure we pass this bill before the end of the year. It is that important. It is the most important bill that comes before this body, and we need to do everything we can to guarantee the certainty to those who serve. In Virginia, we are so connected to active duty service and to our veterans. My wife and I are a Blue Star family. This is very important. We've got to make sure that we pass this bill. Let me start with personnel, a personnel issue that matters a lot to me, the veterans' unemployment rate. Right now, it is unacceptable that veterans, especially enlisted who served in Iraq and Afghanistan, have an unemployment rate that's higher than the national average. A report that was issued last week by the Bureau of Labor Statistics states that unemployment rate for veterans who served since 9-11 remains around 10 percent, higher than non-veterans of the same age. 10 percent represents 246,000 individual veterans of that era who want to work but don't have it. That's why I introduced as my first legislation in April the Troop Talent Act of 2013, a companion bill on the House was introduced by Representative Tammy Duckworth. The bills have been incorporated into the NDAAs in both armed services committees. They are now on the floor virtually identical, and it's a strategy to deal with our veterans' unemployment rate by making sure that active duty military receive civilian credentials for the skills they obtain in the military at the moment they obtain them. The bill has a number of provisions. My colleagues on the Armed Services Committee were, were good enough to include in the underlying bill. This bill will help us deal with veterans unemployment rate. That's one of the reasons I so much want to get to it and I'm so strongly supportive. Second, shipbuilding. Mr. President, you and I both have a real interest in this, in this topic, as all Americans do. It's an area of great importance to the state. And in Virginia, we manufacture the largest items on the planet Earth, which is a nuclear aircraft carrier at the Huntington Ingalls Shipyard in Newport News. As the Defense Department reorients resources and strategy towards Asia, we've got to find the Navy bearing more and more of the operational burden of our military and that policy shift. And we have to continue to provide the Navy with adequate resources and funding through this provision to support that shift and to support shipbuilding. Unfortunately, sequestration, and I'll finish with sequestration in a minute, poses grave dangers. And so we need to do what we can to maintain this priority for shipbuilding. Uh, right now, the sequester has reduced our normal level of three carrier strike groups and three amphibious ready groups, which weakens our readiness to deal with challenges in a very challenging world. We've got to maintain the priority. The NDA bill does that. Another reason I support it. The issue of sexual misconduct. You know, it's, it, 2014 is going to be remembered as a potentially historic year for a good reason in the military. I want to make sure that it, that, that, that history that's good is not clouded by our continued inability to grab onto and reduce the issue of sexual misconduct. In 2014, earlier in the year, I know members of this body were very happy when Secretary Hagel and the military leadership embraced the proposition that women should be able to serve in the military without being barred by gender from any military specialty, that military specialties could have rigorous physical or training criteria, but, though, but that both men and women should be able to compete to serve in any military specialty, even combat-related specialties in the military, we will be remembered, 2014 will be remembered for that. But that memory will, will fade by comparison if what we're really remembered for is we missed an opportunity, an important opportunity to tackle the important issue of sexual assault. I want to congratulate Senators Gillibrand and McCaskill for all the great work that they've done to bring this to the attention of the body and to, to look the military in the eye and say this has got to stop. They've said it would stop over and over again for 20 years and it hasn't. This has to be the moment when it stops. 
And these senators, working together with us on the Armed Services Committee, have put together a sizable package of reforms that I'm confident will help this time be different. I also want to thank the brave victims who testified. I went to every hearing in the Senate on these sexual assault issues. Senator Gillibrand had a personnel committee hearing. I was there for that entire hearing. Senator Levin had a hearing in Armed Services. I was there for nearly that entire full day hearing. Committee markups in the subcommittee of personnel and the full committee. I've been to all the meetings and I've heard these victims testify and how brave they are as survivors to come forward and testify. And I also thank survivors in Virginia who come and shared their stories with me personally so that I could grapple with what is the right mix. These survivors have done a wonderful job in making sure that we address this issue. I tackled the issue of sexual assault in a way when I was governor. We were treating victims of sexual assault in the civil justice system poorly in Virginia. We weren't unique in that, but there was no excuse for it. And so I impaneled a group of advocates and survivors to look at Virginia law and tell us what we needed to change if we were going to try to deal with this scourge. And one of the problems with sexual assault is together with domestic violence, it is often a very underreported crime. If somebody breaks into my apartment, I don't hesitate to call the police and say there's been a break in. If somebody bashes my car windshield in, I don't hesitate to call in and say, look, a crime's been committed. But crimes of sexual assault and crimes of domestic violence, and there tends to be an overlap, not completely, but there's an overlap, are crimes where there's underreporting in both civilian, military, on college campuses. And so one of the most important things you have to do in any reform is to create an environment where people feel like they can come forward with a complaint when they have it. The statistics are well known. They've just been cited on the floor. By a statistical sampling, it's been estimated 26,000 instances of, of, of unwanted sexual conduct, sexual assaults in the military, only, only 3,000 reported. We have to make sure that these reforms that we are about to embrace help us deal with this reporting issue so that people feel a sense of comfort. What we realized in tackling these issues in Virginia is that for people to feel comfortable with reporting sexual assaults, they have to have time. You can't make them make the decision about reporting in an incident. There's often a psychological component about deciding what to do. There needs to be privacy and discretion and confidence. And there also needs to be advice and resources. People need to know what are the avenues that they have, what are the legal procedures, how do they look, and what their rights are if they decide to pursue a complaint. I support the ongoing bill that's on the floor, and I'll support some other proposals that are out, the McCaskill AOT proposal I'll support. I support the reform for a number of reasons. It affects the training and evaluation of military personnel. It affects the way sexual assault allegations are investigated, the way they're prosecuted, and the way they're punished. It protects witnesses. An amendment that Senator Warner and I got into the bill and we'll be adding to it on the floor protects whistleblowers who blow the whistle on an unfortunate or sexually harassing climate. But the most important part of this bill is what the bill does for anyone who's been victimized by a crime of sexual assault to create a climate where they can come forward and lodge a complaint. In the military right now, there are a number of avenues whereby somebody who has been victimized by a crime of sexual assault can lodge a complaint. Unique in this form of crime, there is a restricted report where someone can come forward and report confidentially. And that's very, very important. But this bill adds to it what I think is the core of driving up reporting, which is salutary. It adds to it also something that would be unique in the military. It would exist for no other crime category, no other, no other offense category. If someone complains of a sexual assault, they will be assigned a special victim's counsel whose job it is to have their back, to hear the, the painful story, to share the various reporting mechanisms, counseling resources that are available, how the crime might be prosecuted. And at every step along the way, as that victim is becoming a survivor and dealing with the challenge that special victims council will be there to help them make decisions and and give them the backup and support that they need now this is based on a pilot in the air force a pilot project in the air force that is working and what we're finding based on this pilot project in the air force is even when people file complaints in a restricted confidential way and they come in and they say i want to file a complaint but i don't want to go against the perpetrator because i don't want people to know i just want help 
after they get a special victims advocate and learn about the proceedings and learn about the protections and they build up a bond with somebody who has their back, they're very likely to say, you know what, now I have the confidence to actually file my complaint publicly and take on a perpetrator who needs to be taken on, who needs to be drummed out of the military if they committed a sexual assault. And so I believe the core of this getting this right is about giving victims an avenue where they can have the time, they can have the advice, they can have the privacy and discretion to understand what their options are and then make a decision to go forward. And I think if we pass this bill with that Spectral Victims Council, this will be the single best thing we will be able to do to tackle the crime of sexual assault. Finally, let me just conclude, uh, Mr. President, and say a word about sequestration. You know, we, we've for a word that none of us knew before the beginning of 2013, that this word has been spoken so many times on the floor of this body, and no one intended for sequestration to happen when the votes were cast in the summer of 2011. Everyone was told across the board non-strategic cuts to health care, domestic accounts, and to defense would be harmful to us. And we've seen the harm that sequestration is doing to our nation's military at a time when our military is getting more and more dangerous. Indiscriminate across the board cuts is not only hurting all kinds of military priorities, it's also sending a signal to young men and women who are thinking about military careers or who are in the military and deciding how long, how long they want their careers to be. It's sending them a signal that Congress doesn't value what they do. We need to show the men and women of the military that we value what they do. We need to show them by getting an NDA bill done this year. We need to show them by ending sequestration. Will there be savings that we can find in our defense spending? Of course. We ought to be looking at every item of government to determine whether we can do better and save money. But this across-the-board sequester that's, that's grounding air combat wings, that's, that's grounding carrier units, that, that's making us less able to confront a more challenging world is not behavior befitting of the greatness of this nation. I'm a budget conferee right now, working on a budget deal. We are under a Senate and, and House-imposed deadline to try to find that deal by December 13th so the appropriators can work on a budget. We will work diligently on that. I have an optimistic sense about finding a budget deal that enables us to replace this foolish sequester with a more strategic approach that will not hurt our military. Mr. President, I thank you for the time, and I now yield the floor back. And I suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Mr. President, could I ask that the quorum call be suspended for a second? Without objection. Uh, Mr. President, I would like to get unanimous consent for Sergio Aguirre and Eric Bryan, who are two fellows detailed from the Department of Defense to my office, to be granted floor privileges for the pendency of S-1197, the NDA of uh, 2013. Without objection. Thank you. Just the absence of quorum. Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Alexander. From Connecticut. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that the quorum call be lifted. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I want to, first of all, thank the Chairman of the Armed Services Committee and the Ranking Member, Senator Levin and Senator Inhofe, for the leadership they provided to this body and to our nation in fashioning a bill, the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2014, that truly serves our national security and preserves and enhances our national defense. And I want to thank uh, my colleague, Senator McCaskill, for the leadership that she has provided, along with others like Senator Reid and Senator Gillibrand, all who have focused on the issues that are raised by the Military Justice Improvement Act, the need to reform and strengthen our system of prosecuting and providing justice to the survivors of sexual assault. I have 
join with Senator Gillibrand in supporting the Military Justice Improvement Act because I think it embodies the kind of major reform that is necessary to provide enhanced confidence and trust in this system of military justice. Major change that is needed to drive out the scourge of military sexual assault from our armed forces and provide the men and women of our military the strongest and best military in the world now and in the history of the United States with a system of military justice that matches their excellence. The legislation before us, the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2014, provides much needed equipment and training needed by our warfighters. It keeps us dominant across the globe and all of the domains that are necessary for our national defense. It authorizes two new attack submarines for the coming fiscal year, and it keeps us on track for developing the next generation of ballistic missile submarines. These weapon systems, these weapons platforms, and all that is contained in this act are vitally important for the defense of our nation and the debate about the Military Justice Improvement Act should in no way distract us from that mission to maintain and enhance the defense of the United States. This bill enables the Air Force to move forward with a new combat rescue helicopter that will take injured airmen and others to safety. In June, I wrote with five of my colleagues to General Mark Welsh, the Air Force Chief of Staff, to support the Air Force in its efforts to replace the current fleet of HH-60G Pave Hawks with helicopters that can carry more and go further, all the while keeping fuel efficiency and value that the H-60 aircraft provides. This legislation keeps our progress underway in the development and fielding of the Joint Strike Fighter that will assure that our Air Force, Navy, and Marines are ready to respond. This bill has so many critical and valuable elements that should be at the forefront of this debate and evoke appreciation for Senator Levin and Senator Inhofe and the work done by my colleagues on the Armed Services Committee. So I'm proud to support this bill. But at the same time, Congress has a responsibility to transform the time-worn slogan of zero tolerance for military sexual assault into a real plan and strategy that will achieve that goal. For years and years, the military has promised zero tolerance toward sexual assault. And yet, the actual achievement has fallen short. And that is why reporting has been so low and why the crime of military sexual assault is not only underreported but underprosecuted. The goal of the Military Justice Improvement Act is to improve reporting because without reporting, there can't be investigating and there can't be prosecution, which means there can be no punishment and no prevention and protection. Those are the goals of this major reform. Better reporting and enhanced prosecution to deter this horrific crime and to make sure that victims are better protected and the crime itself prevented. This bill requires the Secretary of Defense to avoid, afford victims of crime prosecuted under the Uniform Code of Military Justice rights, such as protections from unreasonable delay and the right to be heard. This bill gives those protections even without the Military Justice Improvement Act. It also obligates the Secretary of Defense to ensure these rights 
are enforceable, and it affords every victim a special victim's counsel. Again, measures on which there is consensus provided in the bill right now. And I'm pleased that in response to my request to the Defense Appropriations Committee, when this provision is authorized in this legislation, there will be $25 million appropriated to stand up this program system-wide and defense-wide. So the legislation before us has many good things, even without the Military Justice Improvement Act. And I am proud of the reforms that are accomplished in this bill on which we agree. Where we disagree is on the proposal to take prosecutorial decisions out of the chain of command. And that is a narrower change than many people appreciate because the rest of the system, which is required for the present command and control authority, would be essentially maintained. What is taken out of the chain of command is simply the prosecutorial decision so that an experienced, trained, objective profession can make those decisions. And I really believe that this measure, if it's adopted, as I hope it will be, will lead the military at some point, those commanders who may resist it now, to actually thank the United States Senate and the Congress for taking these decisions out of their hands so that they can focus on the incredible challenges of military readiness and preparedness so that they can do what they are trained to do, which is to train their men and women and maintain and enhance our readiness so that they can do professionally what is their prime mission, which is to fight wars and defend our nation. These decisions about prosecuting sexual assault cases can be better made by trained, experienced prosecutors who have the expertise in their field that our military commanders have in their field. And I think it will serve the entire interest of our military to make sure that these decisions are made by those military professionals in JAG offices, just as they are trained in other areas of expertise that require that kind of training. I am listening to the voices of victims as to what will enhance their reporting and eliminate their fear of reprisal and retaliation. On Monday, I was joined by four survivors of military sexual assault to discuss the need for reforming military justice. And I want to express my appreciation for Army Staff Sergeant Sandra Lee, Army Sergeant Cheryl Eberg, Air Force Staff Sergeant Patty Duman, and Marine Corps Corporal Maureen Friedley, each demonstrating that day that their shared experiences of military justice warrant the reforms contained in the Military Justice Improvement Act. And I'd like to share just one. Marine Corps Corporal Friedley, who was sexually assaulted by a fellow Marine in 2006 while attending the School of Music. She pressed charges against her attacker and requested an unrestricted investigation. And I will now read her words into the record. I went, and I'm quoting, I went to an NCIS investigator who questioned me about the day I was attacked and after hearing my testimony told me that I would have to take a lie detector test to ensure that I was not filing falsely. I agreed to it, but I was never asked anything by my investigator again. My chain of command made it very clear that they preferred my attacker, who was a platoon leader, and supported him through everything. When I graduated from the school and went to, on to my duty station in San Diego, California, my new chain of command tried to help me find out 
what had happened in my case as I had not heard about it for several months. A few weeks passed before we found that my paperwork had been mishandled and I was told that nothing could be done and my attacker would go out to the fleet. Eventually, it was found that he had sexually assaulted several other women and he was administratively separated from the Corps, not charged and not given a dishonorable discharge. Her remarks say more than I ever could about the need for enacting the Military Justice Improvement Act. The reforms contained in the measure already are a vitally important step in the right direction. Taking these decisions out of the chain of command are important to good order and discipline because eliminating the crime of sexual assault and providing for greater reporting is vital to good order and discipline. Our experience shows that it has worked when our allies implemented it. And whatever the claims about numbers of cases reported in those allies' armies, clearly they are satisfied with the way it has worked there. And finally, let me just say, I appreciate the bipartisan efforts on this bill on both sides. I think that eventually we will see this kind of reform. Whether it is approved today or not, history is moving in this direction, demanded and driven by the brave men and women who have suffered from this crime, the survivors and victims whose voices we have heard, and the commanders and veterans who have come forward to us, all of the major veterans organizations who have made their voices heard to us and who wholeheartedly have said this kind of reform is necessary to vindicate and support the brave men and women who put their lives on the line for our nation day in and day out, whose excellence should be matched by a military justice system that truly and really looks for zero tolerance and achieves zero tolerance in sexual assault. Madam President, I yield the floor. Madam President. The Senator from Oregon. Madam President, before he yields the, the floor, I want to commend my colleague from Connecticut in terms, particularly, and I'm going to go into the, some of the history with respect to this so-called zero tolerance you know, policy, because I think when you look back over history, there is a very big gap between the past pledges of zero tolerance for sexual assault and the realities of what we have seen. And I think that's one of the key points that the senator from Connecticut has made among many others, and I thank him for it. It was a very valuable uh, presentation. Madam President, I also want to commend uh, uh, the President of the Senate for her extraordinary work on this. You know, again and again, she has outlined what I think is very constructive, and that is the areas where there is common ground here, common ground to try to address an issue that, as I just went through uh, with Senator, Senator Blumenthal, we've heard past pledges about and that hasn't really come to be. And the President of the Senate's done uh, very fine work on this. Uh, Senator Gillibrand, Senator McCaskill, Senator, De Senator Ayotte, I know the best, but a whole host of, uh, of senators have been interested in this. And I also see my uh, friend from Rhode Island here, uh, Senator Reid. He and Senator Levin have been very interested in this issue over the years. So there's been plenty of good work here. And I think the question, you know, really now is how are we going to make a fundamental break for policies that over the last couple of decades simply have not worked. I mean, you go back to the tailhook scandal. This was in 1991 over the course of a four-day conference in Las Vegas. More than 100 naval and Marine Corps aviation officers sexually assaulted 90 victims. We watched the Secretary of the Navy resign after tailhook. 
his replacement said, and I quote, sexual harassment will not be tolerated and that those who don't get the message will be driven from our ranks. Then there was the Aberdeen debacle five years later, five years after, Madam President, we were told that this would not be tolerated. Five years later, you have the Aberdeen debacle. Army Secretary Togo West, Togo West delivered remarks uh, to the Senate Armed Services Committee titled, There's a Problem and We Mean to Fix It. Once again, years go by and you have another such problem, and that was the 2003 scandal at the Air Force Academy, where 19% of women cadets reported having been sexually assaulted, and 7% reported being the victim of rape or attempted uh, rape. The Air Force Secretary told Congress, and I quote, we will not tolerate in our Air Force nor in our Academy those who sexually assault others, those who would fail to act to prevent assaults. So again, we heard, and certainly I'm not here to doubt the sincerity of those who made you know, those uh, comments, but yet the pattern just continues. You have a horrible, horrible set of sexual you know, assaults, not just one, but multiple ones. You have these pledges for zero tolerance, and yet you just have one event after, after another. And after the 2003 scandal, again the pledges of zero tolerance, you had uh, the Joint Base San Antonio Lackland scandal where some 30 training instructors were accused of offenses ranging from improper relationships with trainees to sexual assault and rape. In response, the Secretary of Defense said, as so many of his predecessors in the military said, and I will quote, the command structure from the chairman on down have made very clear to the leadership in this department that this is intolerable and it has to be dealt with. We have absolutely no tolerance for any form of sexual assault, unquote. So, the pattern through all of these instances, Madam, Madam President, is zero tolerance. Quote, we will fix up this. And these comments, as I say, I don't question the sincerity of those who made them. These were officials in the military who have served their country with great distinction and great valor, but the bottom line is the bottom line. When they said there would be zero tolerance, somehow those policies didn't actually work as it related to the real life for those who wear the uniform of the United States. So today, Madam President, the military officer in charge of sexual abuse education at Fort Hood is under investigation for running a prostitution ring. Two Navy football players await trial in a military court on charges of sexual assault. And today, a West Point sergeant stands accused of secretly videotaping female cadets in the uh, showers. So it seems to me that because of the good work of so many here, and I cited the President of the Senate, uh, Senator Reid, who is uh, uh, managing uh, the bill at, at, at this point, uh, Senator Gillibrand, uh, Senator McCaskill, I think we're now in a position to finally make some significant uh, changes and turn these past pledges of zero tolerance into a new reality that really ensures that those who wear the uniform of the United States do have a new measure of protection from uh, sexual assault. So, in, a, in effect, it's a new zero tolerance policy, Madam President, a new uh, policy that says zero tolerance for promises that go unfulfilled. Zero tolerance for a culture in which these assaults are treated as something less than the violent crimes they are. Zero tolerance for a system that continues to fail so many. Now, the Pentagon estimates that in 2012, some 26,000 service members experienced sexual assault. And some, I know, have looked at this issue as sort of a glorified hazing kind of uh, matter, boys being boys, a discipline uh, issue. 
But I think Senator Fisher, one of our uh, colleagues who has come to the Senate uh, most recently, has been correct to point out this is not a gender issue. This is a violence issue. And it's a violence issue because sexual assault, it's called assault for a reason. It is assault. We're talking about a violent crime that involves control and domination. And I think it's also worth noting that uh, somewhere in the uh, vicinity of close to half of military uh, assault victims uh, are men. In fact, the Department of Defense estimates that 14,000 of those 26,000 victims last year uh, were men. So, Madam President, I know colleagues are, are waiting to, uh, to speak, and I would simply wrap up by way of saying that I think the uh, bill, the committee bill, uh, takes some constructive steps in the right direction. I'd like to see it uh, go further. It's why I've joined a bipartisan group of colleagues to support Senator Gillibrand's uh, legislation that would remove the decision to prosecute from the chain of command and give it to experienced, impartial uh, military uh, lawyers. And suffice it to say, we are going to have to come to grips, colleagues, with this uh, question of assault, and particularly success, sexual assault, in a variety of forms. This is not the place to discuss it, Madam President, but yesterday Senator Cornyn and I and Senator Klobuchar introduced a fresh approach to dealing with sex trafficking, which is also sexual assault. So there will be an opportunity to discuss that bipartisan uh, bill in, uh, in the future. But I know colleagues are, are waiting. This is the time. This is the time to close the gap, Madam President, between all of those unfulfilled promises about how there would be zero tolerance for sexual assault and a new reality that affords a new measure of protection from sexual assault for those who wear the uniform of the United States. That's the opportunity we have in the Senate today. That's the opportunity we have to achieve that goal in a bipartisan manner. And with that, Madam President, I yield the floor. Madam President. The Senator from Rhode Island. Thank you, Madam President. When sexual abuse occurs in a military unit, or when a service member is a victim or a perpetrator of sexual abuse, we have failed. Certainly, the military has failed. But Congress, with its constitutional mandate to make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces and to provide for disciplining the militia shares in that failure. That is why the efforts of Senator McCaskill and Senator Gilderbrand and indeed all of my colleagues are so important and so commendable. They have elevated this debate and challenged this Congress and our military to act. They have recognized through their passionate advocacy that sexual abuse not only is a violation of an individual, but it is a corrosive force that can undermine the trust that is essential for the functioning of any military unit. The essence of military service is selfless service in which every soldier, sailor, marine, and airman must be prepared to give his or her life for a comrade. Sexual abuse is the antithesis of that ethic. It represents predatory behavior and exploitation, not selfless sacrifice and protection of those you serve with. It has no place in the military, and if not eliminated, it will insidiously destroy our military. No technology, no amount of resources can ensure military success if courage, courage and character fail. And sexual abuse is a cowardly act that betrays the ethic and character of the military. I believe we are united on this point. This debate is about preventing sexual abuse, a shared goal of every member of the Senate, of the Congress, of the military, of this nation. The question is how best to achieve this essential goal. I believe it requires leadership at every stage. Recruitment, training, evaluation, promotion, retention, and punishment. And I believe commanders must be involved in every step. They must be responsible, and their subordinates must recognize this responsibility and their authority. To remove the commander from any of these responsibilities will, in my view, 
weaken his or her effectiveness in every one of these dimensions. I had the privilege of commanding a company of paratroopers in the 82nd Airborne Division. I was responsible directly for non-judicial company-grade punishment under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. But it was clear to me and to my troops that the battalion, the brigade commander, and the division commander had court martial authority and would necessarily confer with their subordinate commanders in the execution of this authority. This reality, this authority, permeated everything that we did and reinforced the policy orders of every commander, including myself. Now, I'll admit that my deck experience is decades old, and it preceded the integration of women into combat units like an airborne infantry battalion, but the central role of the commander has not diminished. Moreover, the experiences of the 60s and 70s also reveal a military struggling with serious and corrosive problems, principally racial integration and drug use. Congress and the military ultimately dealt with these problems, not by bypassing commanders, but by holding them and through them every member of the armed forces to higher standards. Today, the American military is the first institution anyone points to when noting the progress we have made in racial equality and opportunity. This was not always the case. Incidents with racial overtones plagued the Vietnam period and the post-Vietnam era. Among the most widely publicized were a race riot among prisoners in a stockade in Vietnam in 1968, and several incidents aboard naval vessels in the early 1970s. In one of these incidents in 1972, on the carrier Kitty Hawk, there was a 15-hour melee between black and white sailors. Effectively, that carrier, that ship, capital ship of the Navy, was absolutely ineffectual. They weren't prepared to fight the enemy. They were fighting each other. In May of 1971, there were four days of rioting at Travis Air Force Base in California, ignited by racial incidents on the base. Over 100 individuals were arrested, and more than 30 Air Force personnel were treated for riot-related injuries. The Marine Corps saw serious racial classes at, clashes at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, and at Kanaoi Naval Air Station in Honolulu. In the Army, especially in Germany, there were frequent racial classes. In December of 1970, a special investigating team reported to President Nixon on the situation in Europe and declared that black troops were experiencing, quote, acute frustration and volatile anger because of their treatment. Interestingly, this report cited as a major cause of this frustration, quote, the failure in too many instances of command leadership to exercise the authority and responsibility in monitoring the equal opportunity provisions that were already a part of military regulations. The military has made significant progress on racial opportunity. I am sure more can and should be done, but the progress to date has been driven principally by command leadership at every stage including the enforcement of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. The point was made by Charles Moskos and John Sibley Butler, two of the foremost authorities on race relations in the military. In 1996, they wrote, perhaps surprisingly, no army regulation deals solely with race relationships or equal opportunity. Instead, these issues fall under Army Regulation AR 600-20, whose broad concern is Army Command Policy. This title is more than symbolic. The Army treats good race relations as a means to readiness and combat effectiveness, not as an end in itself. This is the foundation for the Army's way of overcoming race. Racial concerns are broadened into a general leadership responsibility, and commanders are held accountable for race relations on their watch. Once again, the emphasis is on commanders not specialized legal procedures that bypass commanders. My best judgment is that we will make the most progress addressing the issue of sexual abuse by involving and holding commanders accountable, not by excluding them from a critical aspect of military life. Now, under the leadership of Senator Levin and Senator Inhofe, the Armed Services Committee made significant changes to provisions regarding sexual abuse in the military. Moreover, Senators McCaskill, 
AYOT and Fisher will make additional changes in their proposed amendment that will further strengthen our commitment and our ability to respond to the crisis of sexual abuse in the military. But it is also, I think, important to describe the ongoing efforts by the Department of Defense to deal with sexual abuse in the military. I am drawing on the testimony of Lieutenant General Flora D. Darpino. She is the Judge Advocate General of the Army. And she describes the policy effective in the Army, but generally there are equivalent procedures in the other services. The Army began a major effort to combat sexual abuse beginning in 2004 with the creation of the Sexual Assault and Prevention and Response Programs, the SPAR programs, or SAPR programs. The implementation of restrictive reporting was also included, and this allows victims of sexual assault to confidentially disclose the crime to specifically identified individuals and receive medical treatment and counseling without triggering the official investigative process. This program has evolved into a comprehensive effort, fielding a capability of over 11,000 personnel, deployable and available 24 hours a day to respond to the victim's needs. Included in the procedures available under the SAPR program are new reporting options to the victim, expedited transfers, access to victim advocates, and most recently, access to victim counsel. In addition, this program has a significant educational component that saturates soldier training from the first days of initial entry training to senior leader forums. The training focuses on bystander intervention and is linked to Army values that bond soldiers as a team. And it reinforces the military ethic of selfless service over predation and self-gratification. In 2009, the Army recognized the need for improved training and resources for the prosecution of these crimes. Special victim prosecutors were created in the Judge Advocate General's Corps, and sexual assault investigators were created in the Criminal Investigation Division, the CID. Together, these specially trained and experienced professionals work only special victim cases. They are able to apply unprecedented expertise. In addition, all JAG prosecutors and defense counsels have received enhanced training regarding cases involving sexual abuse. With all these changes, Lieutenant General Darpino still identifies the commander as, quote, the critical element. In her words, quote, the most critical element of this institutional effort, however, is the focus of commanders. As such, she points out, again quoting her, the Army, like the other services, has moved aggressively to hold commanders accountable for setting a command climate that encourages reporting, deplores conduct that degrades or harasses individuals, and provides a safe environment free of retaliation for victims after they come forward. To support this effort, officers and commanders are receiving enhanced training at every level. Specifically, the officers entrusted with the disposition of sexual assaults, and that's been withheld to the 06 or the full colonel level, Special Court Martial Convening Authority, are required to attend senior officer legal orientation courses at the Judge Advocate General's Legal Center and School with a focus on the proper handling of sexual assault allegations. General officers, who will serve as convening authorities, are offered one-on-one -on -one instruction legal responsibilities, again, with a focus on sexual assault. Most significantly, most significantly, in my view, and most recently, the Secretary of the Army on September 27, 2013, directed that every officer and non-commissioned officer will be rated on how well he or she, quote, forced a climate of dignity and respect and adhered to the sexual harassment assault response program, the new terminology for the pre-existing program. Secretary McHugh and General Ordierno have made it clear that commanders and senior leaders are responsible. Their advancement, their retention, their standing in the Army will rest with an annual, explicit, written rear view of their efforts to combat sexual abuse. Now let me return a moment to my discussion of the racial challenge facing the Army while I serve. Let me also return to the comments of Charlie Moskos, the most respected academic authority, and also an Army veteran. In 1986, he wrote, more important for blacks than the new race relations curriculum was the revision of the efficiency report, performance evaluations that carries a lot of weight in all promotions. Starting in the early 1970s, a new category appeared in the efficiency reports for officers and NCOs, 
race relations skills. Filling out this section was mandatory and the requirement was rigorously enforced. More blacks received promotions. Some officers with a poor record on race were relieved of command. All of this set a tone. If for only self-interest, Army officers and NCOs became highly sensitive to the issue of race. Today, he's talking about 1986, one is more likely to hear racial jokes in a faculty club than in an officer's club, and in an officer's club, one will surely see more blacks. I think we've made great progress. Finally, finally focusing on the evaluation of official reports that every officer and NCO must in receive each year. Now, in the context of what the military is doing to combat sexual assault, in the context of glaring examples of what it is not doing and what it is failing to do, the Armed Services Committee, after multiple hearings and thoughtful debate, adopted significant provisions that should rapidly and dramatically combat sexual abuse within the military. The Secretary of Defense has already taken administrative steps to implement some of these provisions. Senator McCaskill will offer additional provisions with her amendment that I wholeheartedly support. It is important to recognize the comprehensive and critical nature of these provisions that are already in the National Defense Authorization Act. From improving measures to prevent sexual assault, to protecting victims when it does happen, and strengthening the judicial process to discipline those who commit such heinous crimes. The bill makes important changes that will improve the prevention of sexual assault. First, the bill prohibits the commissioning of or enlistment of individuals convicted of rape, sexual assault, forcible sodomy, or incest, or attempting to commit these offenses. Starting at the beginning, who do you, pull, who do you allow in the military? Second, the bill requires the Secretary of Defense to report on whether legislative action is required to modify the ECMJ to prohibit sexual acts and contacts between military instructors and their trainees. The next step is to ensure that all service members understand how they can and must prevent and respond to incidents of sexual assault. Each of the services is conducting a variety of training programs on sexual assault prevention and response. This bill requires the Secretary of Defense to conduct a comprehensive review of the adequacy of this training and to then prescribe and regulation such modifications to address any inadequacies identified by this review. The bill also requires the Secretary of Defense to review the adequacy of the training, qualifications, and experience of individuals assigned to positions responsible for sexual assault prevention and response, to retrain or reassign any individual who does not have adequate training or qualifications, and to improve the requirements for selection and assignment to sexual assault prevention and response billets. Service members who have been sexually assaulted or raped should have every resources available to report the incidents, to receive care, and to see that justice is done. In crafting this bill, the committee acknowledged that many victims do not report such incidents because of the fear of retaliation from their peers and leaders. So this legislation includes a provision that makes retaliation against service members for reporting criminal offenses a punishable offense under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. This will ensure that both victims and witnesses to such crimes are able to report the occurrence without facing retaliatory action or threat of such action. This bill also requires the DOD Inspector General to review and investigate allegations of retaliatory personnel actions for reporting a rape, sexual assault, or sexual misconduct. Next, the bill expands certain existing protections to victims who are members of the National Guard and Reserves and members of the Coast Guard. First, it requires the service secretaries to ensure that members of the National Guard and Reserves have access to a sexual assault response coordinator not later than two business days following a request for such assistance. These coordinators explain the reporting process, address the victim's safety and security needs, and offer expertise and available services, including medical care, counseling, and legal support. Second, it clarifies that an existing requirement for the expedited change of station or unit transfer requested by a victim of sexual assault also applies to members of the Coast Guard. The bill requires the service secretaries to provide a special victims counsel to provide legal advice and assistance to service members who are victims of the sexual assault committed by a member of the armed forces. This resource was initially created by the Air Force in a program that began in January of this year. Since the committee's markup of this bill, Secretary of Defense Hagel has directed each of the services to implement such a program. This provision will codify administrative action that has already been taken. The bill also authorizes the service secretaries to provide guidelines to commanders 
regarding their authority to temporarily reassign or remove from an assignment a service member on active duty who is accused of committing or attempting to commit a sexual assault offense not as a punitive measure but solely for the purpose of maintaining good order and discipline within the member's unit. And additionally, the bill directs the Secretary of Defense to provide information and discussion of this authority as part of the required training for new and prospective commanders at all levels of command. The bill also makes several changes to further strengthen the judicial process. First, the bill eliminates the element of the character and military service of the Qs, the so-called good soldier defense, from the factors a commander should consider in de deciding how to dispose of an offense. I should add that Senator McCaskill's amendment further limits the defendant's use of good military character as evidence. Second, the bill requires the defense counsel and court marshals to make a request to interview complaining witnesses through the trial counsel, and if requested by the witness, requires that defense counsel interviews take place in the presence of the trial counsel, counsel for the witness, or outside counsel to protect against the abuse of this process. Next, the bill changes Article 60 of the UCMJ to limit the ability of a continuing authority to modify the findings of a court martial to specific sexual offenses. In other words, this provision eliminates a commander's ability to overturn a jury's conviction for sexual assault, rape, and other crimes. Additionally, the bill requires a mandatory minimum sentence of dismissal or dishonorable discharge of a service member convicted of a sexual assault offense. The bill also eliminates the five-year statute of limitations on trial by court-martial for certain sexually related offenses and requires that substantiated complaints of sexually related offenses resulting in a court-martial conviction, non-judicial punishment, or administrative action be noted in the service record of the service member regardless of the member's grade. Importantly, the bill maintains and strengthens the role of commanders in the judicial process. During the markup of this bill, the committee adopted an amendment on a bipartisan basis that preserves the ability of commanders to initiate court-martial proceedings. Removing this authority, which some of our colleagues advocate, would weaken accountability and undermine efforts to combat sexual assault. Commanders have the responsibility to train their subordinates. They are charged with maintaining good order and discipline within their units and they are responsible for the safety of the men and women they lead. The commander is essential to instilling among the members of his or her unit that sexual assault and related behaviors will not be tolerated and will be adjudicated. The bill includes several provisions that address the role of the commanding officer. First, it requires commanding officers to immediately refer to the appropriate military criminal investigation organization reports of sexually related offenses involving service members in the commander's, in the commander's chain of command. Next, the bill requires automatic higher-level review of any decision by a commander not to prosecute a sexual assault allegation, with the review going all the way to the service secretary in any case in which the commander disagrees with the military lawyer's recommendation to prosecute. If a legal counsel advises prosecution and the commander does not do it, ultimately it will be resolved by the service secretary. And most commanders do not want their decisions reviewed by service secretary. I think this will add more sense and more purpose to their efforts to combat sexual abuse. All of these changes take significant steps forward in addressing these horrible crimes. However, we must remain committed to further improving both prevention and response. That's why the bill includes several provisions related to the review that is currently underway by the independent panel created by last year's Defense Authorization Bill, the Response Systems to Adult Sexual Assault Crimes Panel. This committee is assessing the systems used to investigate, prosecute, and adjudicate crimes involving sexual assault. The bill we are considering today assigns additional issues to be considered by this panel and requires the panel to produce its report no later than one year from its first meeting, which occurred in July, rather than 18 months as originally laid out in last year's law. Now, as I mentioned before, Senator McCaskill, Ayotte, and Fisher are proposing an amendment that further strengthens all of these provisions that are already in the committee's bill. First, their amendment requires special victim counsels to advise victims of the advantages and disadvantages of their cases being prosecuted in a civilian court with jurisdiction or through the Uniform Code of Military Justice. The victim may express his or her preference, and this preference must be afforded great weight in the determination to prosecute the offense by court-martial or by a civilian court. 
The amendment codifies the decision by the Department of the Army to evaluate the performance of soldiers in adhering to the standards regarding sexual assault prevention and response. It extends this provision to every service in the Department of Defense. As previously noted in the context of race relations, this provision is likely to make a profound and lasting contribution to the prevention of sexual abuse. And that's what we're about here, preventing sexual abuse. And this could be one of the key drivers in that prevention effort. The amendment also improves the accountability of commanders by requiring that a command climate assessment be performed after an incident involving a covered sexual offense, as defined in the legislation, for both the command of the victim and the command of the accused, if they are in separate commands, or a single assessment, if they are in the same command. These assessments will be completed promptly and provided to the Military Criminal Investigation Organization conducting the investigation of the offense concerned and to the next higher commander in the chain of command of the affected unit. You will know if you're a commander, if there is an incident in your unit, that all the details will be known by your battalion commander, your brigade commander, your division commander, all the way up. And that will be another strong incentive to make sure that nothing happens in your unit. And that is part of the amendment proposed by my colleagues. This position, particularly in conjunction with the requirement to evaluate service members' compliance under the official reports, will go a long way, I think, to provide the accountability and the emphasis on commanders to do their jobs. General Bruce Clark, a distinguished officer, wounded in the Battle of Bowles, was awarded the Silver Star as one of the great heroes of the United States Army famously instructed his units that, in his words, an organization does well only those things the boss checks. Well, we are checking each individual to make sure, commander, non-commissioned officer, they're doing their best. We're checking each unit if there's an incident in that unit, and we are living up to the advice of General Clark. It'll get done because, finally, it'll be checked consistently, thoroughly, and appropriately. The amendment also establishes a confidential process that will enable a victim of a sexual assault who is subsequently discharged to challenge the terms or characterization of his or her discharge in order to correct possible instances of retaliation. This provision will help ensure that a discharge accurately reflects the service of the individual, taking into consideration the effects of sexual assault, and also helps to remove the concern that reporting sexual abuse could influence the character of a military discharge. Reporting should never influence the character of a military discharge. The amendment strengthens the role of the prosecutor in advising commanders on court martial. The committee language requires that the civilian service secretary review all cases where a commander does not choose to prosecute when his or her legal counsel slash judge advocate recommends prosecution. The amendment extends that mandatory review if the prosecutor recommends prosecution and the commander demurs. In effect, if either the prosecutor or the legal counsel slash judge advocate recommends prosecution and the commander demurs, the case will automatically be referred to the civilian service secretary. You will have the highest ranking civilian in the uniformed service making the final call, and every commander knows that and will know that. The amendment modifies the military rules of evidence to prevent defendants from introducing evidence of good military character as a general defense of a charge. Such evidence may only be admitted if that trait is relevant to an element of the offense for which the accused has been charged. Too often the good soldier defense has been seen as overcoming specific evidence directly related to a crime. This appearance undermines the essential perception that a verdict is determined by direct evidence supporting the elements of the crime, not the previous reputation of the defendant. This provision builds upon a section in the underlying bill that eliminates character and the military service to accuse from factors a commander should consider in deciding how to dispose of an offense. Finally, the amendment ensures that all of the protections of this legislation are extended to the cadets and midshipmen of our service academies. The McCaskill A. Yacht Fisher Amendment strengthens the committee bill through enhanced accountability of commanders and additional changes to the Uniform Code of Military Justice. We will strengthen prevention and prosecution of sexual abuse. Now, those who argue for the exclusion of the commander from the judicial process point to the policies of our allies, including Canada, the United Kingdom, Australia, and Israel. 
These countries have removed commanders as convening authorities and used independent military or civilian prosecutors to make charging decisions. While it can be useful at times to draw comparisons between our armed forces and those we serve alongside, there are several points we made with respect to our military justice system that do not align. First, none of these countries changed their system in response to a sexual assault crisis among their ranks or protect the rights of victims more generally. In most cases, the systems were changed to protect the rights of the accused. Second, none of the Allies can draw a correlation between their system and any change in reporting by victims of sexual abuse. Many argue that removing the commander as the decision maker will remove a significant hurdle that victims face in deciding whether to report sexual assaults. There is no statistical or anecdotal evidence that removing commanders from the charging decision has any effect on victims' willingness to report crimes in these judicial systems among our allies. In materials provided to the Response Systems Panel, the Deputy Military Advocate General for the Israeli Defense Force noted an increase in sexual assault complaints between 2007 and 2011, attributing no specific reason for the increase, but noted it could represent an increase in the number of offenses or it could be a result of campaigns by service authorities to raise awareness on the issue. Similarly, the Commodore of the Navy Legal Services for the Britain's Royal Navy has assessed that recent structural changes to the military justice system had, quote, no discernible, unquote, effect on the reporting of sexual assault offenses. Third, the scope and scale of our allies' caseloads are vastly different, primarily because of the much greater size of the U.S. Armed Forces. For example, the KDA military only tried 75 to 80 court marshals last year, which is roughly comparable to one U.S. Army Division's annual caseload. But several of our allies who have changed the military justice system have indicated that the changes have resulted in the process slowing down and taking longer. And frankly, that is one of the issues that victims have raised in terms of why they aren't reporting and why they're so terribly frustrated because of the length and duration of the process. Furthermore, most allies cannot conduct course marshals in a deployed environment. As Brigadier General Richard Gross, the legal counsel, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, stated in a letter, one critical feature, feature of our justice system is its expeditionary nature. The ability to administer justice anywhere in the world our forces deploy. Notably, the Army alone tried over 950 cases in deployed areas over the past 10 years. In one case in Iraq, Four soldiers committed multiple crimes in a single night. The commander referred all four soldiers to court-martial, and they were charged with consuming alcohol, breaking into local Iraqi homes, and stealing property and money from locals. Because the commander in Iraq had the authority to re refer these cases to trial, the first of the trial was underway within two months of the incident. All of the co-accused and many defense witnesses were in the same unit, and local Iraqis were available as fact witnesses. Because the commander had a fully deployable military justice system at his disposal, he was able to send a strong message to the unit that such conduct would be dealt with swiftly and decisively. Simultaneously, he was able to restore positive relations with the local community. The Army has also cited instances of Allied soldiers committing sexual assault crimes against U.S. soldiers. And because of the Allied nation's system removing the authority of the chain of command and removing the process on the battlefield, our commanders would demand but not receive timely information on the status of any prosecution. We had a soldier victim, and they could not find anything about the process that was going on in the Foreign Service. Tragically, and with respect to reporting, sexual assault is a crime that historically is underreported. And this is not with respect simply to the military. The Rape, Abuse, and Incest, Incest National Network cites Department of Justice crime surveys that show an average of 60% of assaults in the last five years were not reported to police. However, in numbers that were released early this month, DOD showed that more service members are coming forward to report sexual assaults. From October 2012 to June 2013, 3,553 sexual assault complaints were reported to DOD. This is a 46% increase over the same period a year ago. These cases include sexual assaults by civilians on service members and by service members on civilians. A significant number of the reported incidents occurred before the victim had even entered military service. Now there's another argument for removing the commander's authority. 
is that independent JAGs, Judge Advocate Generals, or even civilian authorities will prosecute more cases. However, statistics show that commanders from all services have exercised jurisdiction and pursued court martial for sexual assault cases over the determination of civilian authorities. Over the last two years, Army commanders have exercised jurisdiction in 49 sexual assault cases the local civilian authorities declined to presume. 32 of these cases were tried by court martial, resulting in 26 convictions. The U.S. Marine Corps exercised jurisdiction in 28 sexual assault cases, all of which were tried by court martial. 16 cases resulted in conviction. This goes on throughout every service. Commanders are also having an interest in pursuing court martial as a way to demonstrate the seriousness of the crime and the impact on their unit discipline. Not merely because of the quantity or quality of evidence that a crime has occurred. Now, on June 4th, the Armed Services Committee had a hearing on the legislative proposals to address sexual assault in the military. We heard from four colonels, Army, Navy, Marine Corps, and Air Force. They all spoke about the importance of seeking legal advice from the command judge advocate and for having a responsibility to adjudicate crimes within their command. Colonel Donna Martin, commander of the Army's 202nd Military Priest Group Criminal Investigation Division, stated that it is of paramount importance that commanders are allowed to continue to be the center of every formation, setting and enforcing standards, and disciplining those who do not. The commander is responsible for all that happens or fails to happen in her unit. She went on to say, the Uniform Code of Military Justice provides me with all the tools I need to deal with misconduct in my unit, from low-level offenses to the most serious, including murder and rape. I cannot and should not relegate my responsibility to maintain discipline to a staff officer who someone else is outside the chain of command. When asked about the, whether a commander might be more likely to pursue a court martial than even an outside independent officer because of the desire to send a message and enforce discipline within the unit, Marine Colonel King replied that he considers quote, achieving justice wherever crime was committed, and also the message that I send to the thousands of Marines that are actually watching what's going on. So I can, even if I have failed to achieve a conviction at whatever level, still send a powerful message to them that this kind of conduct, even alleged, even not proven, is completely unacceptable. And Colonel Jeannie Levitt, commander of the 4th Fighter Wing, stated, I could absolutely see the scenario where a prosecutor may not choose to prosecute a case or recommend prosecuting a case because of the likelihood of conviction. However, as the commander, I absolutely want to prosecute the case because of the message it sends so that my airmen understand that they will be held accountable. And then we'll let the jury decide what happened to the case and whether or not it will be convicted. But that message is so important. Whereas an independent prosecutor may not see the need to take it to trial if the proof is not necessarily going to lead to a conviction. Our service JAGs have expressed several concerns about the uh, proposed amendment that my colleague from New York is, is uh, introducing. Um, but I want to just take a moment and talk about uh, the amendment and also essentially thank and commend Senator Gillibrand. Because without her persistence and passion, we would not be here today, frankly. Uh, she perhaps has done more than anyone else to focus our attention on this incredibly heinous crime to individuals and this threat, the good order, discipline, and efficiency of the military. Her objective, the elimination of sexual abuse in the ranks of the military, must be our objective, and it must be realized. And she and her co-sponsors have determined in their view, that the removal of commanders from the application of the Uniform Code of Military Justice for a wide variety of offenses is the best approach to achieve the goal of ending sexual abuse in the military. But as my previous comments clearly indicate, I disagree. Indeed, given the nature of military service, which is significantly different from civilian life, I believe without the active involvement of commanders in every phase of military life, this goal cannot be effectively and rapidly achieved. The approach in the amendment proposed by my colleague from New York poses significant problems in practice that could unwittingly complicate rather than accelerate efforts to end sexual abuse. The amendment attempts to divide crimes designated by specific articles of the UCMJ into two broad categories. Traditional military offenses subject to command adjudication, such as AWOL and insubordination, 
and a broad category of serious offenses that would typically constitute civilian criminal offenses such as murder, robbery, and rape and sexual crimes. In fact, here is a, a chart depicting the division of the Articles of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Now this second category of offenses, disposition by the independent prosecutor, would be removed from command adjudication and be referred to an independent prosecutor. This independent prosecutor must be at least a full colonel with significant experience in trials by general special court martial and be outside the chain of command of the members subject to such charges. This bifurcated system, especially considering the scope of crimes excluded from the chain of command, will have profound effects on the ability of commanders and units to function effectively. Let's take the case, and it's not uncommon, of a soldier who writes five checks on five separate occasions to the $30 each to the PX, knowing he doesn't have the funds to cover his purchases. The Criminal Investigation Division, CID, investigates and informs the commander. Under the Gillibrand Amendment, the CID must refer this case to the independent prosecutor because it falls under Article 123A, making, drawing, or ordering check, etc. These are referred to special prosecutors if they fall in the category and one more criteria. The five separate incidents, although they individually have a maximum punishment of six months, would be charged together, leading to 30 months, which exceeds the one-year threshold for the Gilderman Amendment. And as a result, uh, this would be sent forward to the special prosecutor. I hardly think that charging this soldier for writing bad checks is the intent of the Gilderman Amendment, but it will be the effect. And it also raises the very practical questions of how the independent prosecutor will deal with an onslaught of cases like this when the expectation is that he or she will be focused on sexual abuse and serious crimes like murder. There is a real practical check here. Are you going to take a bad check case when you have 15 pending attempted murders, assaults, rapes, et cetera? That's just a, a practical issue, and I think the answer is probably no. Under the amendment, the independent prosecutor has the choice of convening a special court martial or a general court martial. A special court martial consists of a panel of at least three members or at the service member's election, a military judge sitting alone. There's a prosecutor, referred to as trial counsel, a defense counsel. In comparison, a general court martial is the military highest level where service members are tried for the most serious crimes. It's roughly analogous to the civilian felony court and the maximum punishments are, as you would expect, increased. And before any charge can be sent to a court-martial, a general court-martial, a general court-martial, an Article 32 investigation must be conducted. And it's a hybrid of a civilian grand jury proceeding and a preliminary comprehensive discovery uh, proceeding. And the Article 32 investigation is to be more than a mere formality. It is a, a valuable right for the accused and a source of information for the commander. The general court-martial uh, con may consist of a military judge and not less than five members or a military judge alone, if the defendant chooses. Capital cases require 12 members. Well, as you can see, these proceedings are intensive in terms of time, in terms of commitment of military personnel, in terms of investigatory efforts. Uh, in fact, the average length of special court martial proceedings ranges from three to five months. General court martials can take anywhere from five months to eight months. In cases involving sexual assault, both special and general court martials take longer, an average of nine months. Again, this is probably going to delay the process, not accelerate the process. Now, given the time and resources that are involved in a general or special court martial, in the case of a young soldier writing bad checks and the long-standing practice of reserving general and special court martials for the most serious offenses, I would doubt seriously that the independent prosecutor would take this case. At some point, the independent prosecutor will inform the commander, which raises another issue. If this notification is delayed extensively, you have a related problem of what you do with the soldier under suspicion. Do you deploy him or her subject to recall? Do you leave him behind? So all of these issues are important. 
and the independent prosecutor's decision is binding on any applicable convening authority for a trial by court martial on such charges. It's binding on every commander. The amendment, however, does attempt to preserve authority to punish these types of offenses by declaring that the independent prosecutor's decision, quote, shall not operate to terminate or otherwise alter the authority of commanding officers, close quote, to employ a court martial or to impose non-judicial punishment under Article 15 of the UCMJ. But this authority is absolutely an illusion. Under the UCMJ, every soldier has the right to turn down a summary court-martial or an Article 15. Once he is informed by counsel that he will not be subject to a general court-martial or a special court-martial, and he can turn down a summary court-martial or an Article 15, the soldier will invariably refuse the summary court-martial or Article 15. Ironically, in doing so, he will demand a court-martial. But the commander cannot comply, as he can now, because he's already been preempted by the special prosecutor, the independent prosecutor. Now, this, this scenario will play out over and over again. A unit is plagued by a series of barrack thefts, which unchecked erodes good order and discipline. The commander has information that one soldier is boasting about ripping off people, but he has no other evidence. During a routine health and welfare inspection, an iPhone valued over $500 and reported missing is found in the boasting soldier's room. Under the Gillibrand Amendment, the commander must refer the case to the independent prosecutor. And again, you will have the issues of whether the independent prosecutor takes such a case, and if not, the likelihood that the accused will refuse a summary court martial Article 15 and walk free. Incidents like this, and this is not the intent of the legislation, but this is what will happen. Incidents like this will erode unit cohesion and raise questions, at least implicitly, is who is really running the unit? The commander? An unseen and unknown JAG hundreds of miles away? Or individual soldiers who may appear to be violating the rules with impunity? This question is important here, but it is critical when a commander has to order soldiers to do dangerous things. And that, ultimately, is what commanders have to do. And soldiers have to have no doubt that the commander, he or she, is fully in charge. Now, as I referenced earlier, the bifurcation of articles of the UCMG, UCMJ poses significant challenges even of itself. The problem with the drafting's amendment complicates not just cases of common theft, not just issues that you see as, well, that we can figure a way out but the very issue of sexual assault that we're trying to address. Let's take this, another example, of a married couple, both of whom are active duty service members, who get into a shouting match in their quarters on post. The husband stabs the wife with a kitchen knife and knocks her unconscious. She provides a statement to CID, but later retracts. They have another argument that results in his assaulting her with an attempt to commit rape. Under the Gilderman Amendment, the first offense of a gravitated assault Article 128, would have to be referred to the independent prosecutor to decide whether to send a case to court martial. While the offense of assault with intent to commit rape, which is specified under Article 134, general article is right here, is exempt from the Gillibrand proposal and would be referred to the chain of command. Assuming both the independent prosecutor and the commander seek a general court martial, this particular victim will now have to testify two separate Article 32 hearings, two subsequent court martials, at least doubling the number of times she must recount her nightmare and prolonging the administration of justice. The accused will demand and likely get two separate panels for each set of offenses, thus doubling the number of officers, unavailable other duties in the command, and more than doubling the administrative personnel and witnesses associated with the general court martial. Now, this is a, a situation where rather than streamlining, reinforcing, clarifying the military's efforts to deal with sexual abuse, we've confused them, we've delayed them, we've put commanders in the position of competing with independent prosecutors. This is not, I think, going to add to the solution on a practical basis of how we deal with sexual abuse. We know that so many of the men and women of our armed forces serve our nation selflessly. Every day they're prepared to give their lives for comrades. Sexual assault is the antithesis of this ethic. It has no place in the military, and if not eliminated, 
it will, as I said, insidiously destroy our military. I believe that preventing sexual abuse requires leadership at every stage, and that commanders must be involved in every step. I believe that we will make the most progress in addressing this issue by involving and holding commanders accountable, not by excluding them from a critical aspect of military life. We have worked extensively to include provisions in this bill that will improve the prevention of sexual assault, the protection of victims, and the prosecution of perpetrators. And we must pledge to do more, to continue our oversight of these programs, and make further changes if needed. We owe it to all those who bravely and honorably wear the uniform of our nation. And on that, Madam President, I would yield the floor. Madam President. The Senator from Maryland. Madam President, first uh, let me thank Senator Gillibrand for her leadership on this issue of sexual assaults in our military. I support her